to have a young son brutally murdered is unfathomable. A Georgia man who was once a haunted house scare actor will spend the rest of his life in prison for the gruesome and horrific murder of his own best friend. Brandon knew how much Aaron's siblings needed and loved him, but Brandon stabbed Aaron to death, made him suffer first with that knowledge that Aaron was so needed. The psychological scars from betrayal from one who we treated like a son or brother is irreparable. 23-year-old Brandon Reisner pleaded guilty last month to charges including malice murder, felony murder, assault, battery, concealing the death of another, and removal of body parts from the scene of a death. Reisner was convicted of stabbing and disemboweling his friend, 21-year-old Aaron William Davis. The two were close friends. They went to the same high school and attended the same church. The two would eventually move across the country to attend BYU-Idaho. And while Reisner only attended the school for the fall semester of 2021, Aaron graduated from the university with a political science degree in June of 2022. But by the late fall of that year, everything would change. On November 11th of 2022, Aaron stayed the night with Reisner at his home in Rome, Georgia, while on his way to visit his girlfriend in Alabama, but tragically never would make it to see his girlfriend. Aaron's family would call authorities to report him missing, and during the search for the 21-year-old, police would discover Aaron's car in a ditch near a local park. That clue would lead them to Reisner's home, which would unearth more chilling details. According to prosecutors, Reisner stabbed Aaron 40 times. Then Reisner attempted to dismember his body. Reisner also tried to cover up the murder by putting his friend's body in a suitcase and into the trunk of his car before burying Aaron in a shallow, unmarked grave and ditching the car behind a levee in a local park. After the murder and attempted cover-up, Reisner fled before ultimately turning himself in. Years later, in June of 2024, Reisner pleaded guilty to the horrific crime. During his sentencing hearing, prosecutors revealed more gruesome details into the murder. So a total um, of 40 stab wounds, six to his head, four to his neck, 21 to the torso, two to the left upper extremity, and seven to the right upper extremity. Um, there was also attempted dismemberment um, around his abdomen and around one of his arms and shoulder area. Um, but we believe um, that the dismemberment happened after. Um, the, I do have a few photos, um, not many, uh, just to show some of these injuries because I'm going to talk about the level of hemorrhage associated with the, which, with the injuries. Um, so this is the front and back of Aaron. Um, the injuries have been labeled by the medical examiner um, with the letter system. And I did want to, there are significant injuries to the neck, both in the front and the back. There are also injuries down along this side. Those begin with I and go into JKL. Um, and I'll show a different angle of those later. But I also want to highlight that there are not injuries on Aaron's hands. Aaron didn't have any defensive wounds. Aaron didn't see this coming. Aaron didn't defend himself. This was not a case of mutual combat or anything like that. Um, he does not have any defensive marks on his hands. Here's a side view of those wounds that I mentioned, I, J, K, L, M, and N. Um, and I'm gonna put up a diagram now that um, shows these injuries, but on a drawing instead of the autopsy photos. So this is color coded. Pink means that there is hemorrhage and what hemorrhage indicates is that Aaron's heart was beating. Um, and so his blood was pumping through his body. So those injuries that I talked about on the side over here that we saw a picture of a moment ago, those all have pink. So his heart was beating, his blood was pumping. Also those neck injuries that I pointed out, same thing um, on here and here and here a pink, meaning his heart was beating. Um, most of the colors on here are pink. The orange means minimal hemorrhage. It means that the level of hemorrhage was less, um, most likely because the heart was beating less or it was beating slower. In other words, Aaron was dying at that point. So orange means he was still alive, but his heartbeat was weaker and slower. No color on the chart means that there was no hemorrhage. 
It doesn't necessarily mean post-mortem, but it does mean that his heart wasn't beating at a level to cause a hemorrhage. Most of, of the marks on here are color-coded. And what that means is that Aaron was alive when this happened. And for the majority of these horrific wounds, Aaron's heart was beating and there was hemorrhage and he was alive. And then the next level of wounds shows again the orange hemorrhage, meaning his heartbeat was slower, it was weaker at that point. I will point out that these shaded areas are parts of the dismemberment that we saw um, in the autopsy photos as well. Um, and again, that is believed to have happened post-mortem um, or after Aaron's death. Also, um, part of the autopsy, um, a portion of the small intestine was missing, and it's believed that it was removed through this um, area of dismemberment there. The Floyd County Assistant District Attorney also revealed to the judge disturbing searches Reisner made on the web. So in this one, and these start over here and go in this direction. So this is on November 11th, Friday. At this point, Aaron is dead. The defendant has already killed Aaron. And he is searching over and over for sheets and blankets more than 20 searches for sheets and blankets. What he's trying to do is find a replacement for the sheets and blanket that Aaron is ultimately going to be buried in. He's trying to find a replacement set so that the bedroom will appear unchanged and again to cover up his crime. These are his searches on that day continued. And um, I'll highlight just a few of them. Uh, professional stain remover. Does Walmart have duct tape? Schizophrenia symptoms? Hydrochloric acid? Best secluded locations? How to drain washing machine? And more searches for the sheets and blanket. Um, and, and all of these indicate that he is trying to cover up his crime. Um, he's looking for stain remover to try to get the blood out of the carpet. Um, he ultimately does go to Walmart later that day, um, around 6 p.m., and he does purchase duct tape, and he uses that duct tape um, to uh, wrap Aaron in the blankets that he's ultimately buried in. Um, hydrochloric acid um, is famous because Jeffrey Dahmer used that on some of his victims. That was a search that the defendant made on um, best secluded locations. Ultimately, he buried Aaron in a secluded location, so that was part of his search of what to do with the body. So at this point, he has not buried Aaron because he doesn't have the duct tape and he hasn't found the location yet. I mean, how to drain washing machine, we know from officers that the next day they're gonna discover bloody sheets in the washing room. Um, and so he's already concerned because he's been using the washing machine to try to clean these things. Also in between his searches to cover up his crime, he's also watching videos from No Country for Old Men, which is a horror movie that focuses um, on a murderer, that's the main character, um, and his uh, violent crimes and as he goes out. And one of the videos that the defendant specifically watches is a scene where the murderer has been injured and he needs to go to a pharmacy. So he, he blows up a car to create a distraction to go into a pharmacy. Um, the defendant was also injured at this time. He's later gonna search on for what to do about the cut on his finger. But just interesting that in between all of these searches about what to do with his best friend's body, he's also watching videos from a horror movie about a violent killer. All right, and so on Saturday, November 12th, he is still looking up carpet cleaning crew, also water damage restoration, and a company called Chattanooga Blood Spill Cleanup, and how to clean blood out of carpet. So there's the Chattanooga blood spill, how to clean blood out of carpet. In the days leading up to this, he had some interesting internet searches as well. Um, one of those was one flew over the Cuckoo's Nest book. Um, it's, a, it's a famous book, um, but the premise is that the uh, person is going to be convicted of a serious crime, and so they feign insanity in order to go to um, a mental institution instead of prison. He also looks up multiple times 10 tips for dealing with guilt. And then there's some typos in this, but what I believe it is trying to say is tricks to feel less guilty. 
According to prosecutors, those weren't the only chilling web searches Reisner made. Assistant District Attorney Leah Mayo told the court Reisner also made a post-murder to-do list. But the state also revealed music lyrics posted to Reisner's YouTube channel, which contained shocking lyrics seemingly referencing Aaron's gruesome murder. When I get home, schedule last three songs. That is a reference to his YouTube channel where he did post music. Um, he wrote um, quite a few songs and performed them and had some of them on a YouTube channel. Um, number two, vacuum. Number three, laundry. Number four, shower in my shower. That's important because Aaron was dismembered in the guest shower. So he's making a reminder to himself to shower in his own shower and not the shower he used to attempt to dismember his best friend's body. He also says to take a bath. So again, a preoccupation with cleaning, possibly to try to remove evidence that may still be on his body. And again, vacuum and laundry, these are related again to his attempt to cover up. But then he also, Text a rem he makes a written reminder to basically create an alibi defense via text to his stepmother, Rachel, by saying, text Rachel that Aaron threw up horribly. I think there was some blood in it. I woke up and he was gone. So he actually wrote down what his cover story was going to be in this post-murder to-do list. Um, and we know from his phone records um, that he actually called Rachel that following morning. So he did follow his own to-do list in that regard. So the way notes are organized on the phone is the most recently edited appear first. So this one actually was on top of the post-murder to-do list, which means it had been edited or looked at or worked on after that. And since we know that the post-murder to-do list had been created after the murder, this also was created after the murder. This appears to be some of his lyrics for a song. And the ones I want to highlight are right here. He screamed till he choked on his own tongue and blood. His scream became a garble as he swallowed his tongue. I believe the defendant is describing Aaron's death. His scream became a gargle as he swallowed his own tongue. If you'll remember in his to-do list, the very first one was about um, his music. Music was clearly very important to the defendant. Um, and so this, it, this was a newer song, but he also had some of his older songs that he had created prior to the murder. And I've pulled um, one of those here. It's entitled, What You Do. Um, and I'll highlight what I think is important here. It doesn't matter what you do. Go kill someone, go love someone. You can't plan the future. God decided it for you. It's fine to think that I'm just a little toy. Um, and if these um, are indicative of his philosophy, that is a dangerous philosophy. It is one that shirks all accountability. If there's no free will and everything is predestined, then there's also no consequences for actions, and there's also no reason to ever exercise restraint. And so that is a dangerous philosophy. And it also is a philosophy that doesn't demonstrate remorse. There's no remorse in that type of philosophy because it doesn't matter. The state then called Aaron's loved ones to give victim impact statements. One of the loved ones included Charlie Girl Skellinger, Aaron's girlfriend, who gave a heart-wrenching account on losing the love of her life. Aaron Davis was and is the love of my life. I will never be the same for having known him. He loved me and I loved him. I could tell you a hundred love stories and it would not do justice to how wonderful he was. No one has ever understood me quite like he did. To him, I was seen for my soul. His death shattered me. I was a fragment of who I am. When I received the news that Aaron was dead after running all through Rome in the freezing cold looking for my love, I collapsed outside of a gas station in front of an ice machine and I could not stop screaming. That first night, I slept in my mom's bed I couldn't sleep without waking myself up crying. I couldn't be alone in the dark anymore because I would see Brandon's face lurking around dark corners. It was a blow when we found out Aaron's personal items were missing. We never got Aaron's phone back. I've had nightmares about it since that day. Losing someone's phone feels like losing another little piece of them. 
Aaron and I had special bracelets with the planets on them. We got for our three month anniversary. He kept his bracelet in his car because he wanted to be able to wear it every time we were together. Aaron was infamous, infamous for his bright shirts and sense of style. And some of his most iconic ones were packed for the, for the weekend we had just planned that day. These items with so much sentimental value are lost to us. I had hinged so much of my healing on being able to see Aaron's body one more time. And another blow came when we were denied that opportunity for our own good. The damage to his body was too much. I never got to say goodbye. I never got to hold his hand or touch his face one more time or touch his hair or hug him. I got to kiss a cold casket and hope that he knew how much, how dearly I loved him. We had so many plans for our future and the life we were building together. Thanksgivings and Christmases, family traditions. We wanted to go to the beach together. It was his favorite place. He was one of the most wonderful people to be around. We wanted to have kids and raise them together. He especially wanted a daughter. He loved the idea of all the little experiences that would come with being a girl dad. We talked about being in the delivery room and him getting to do skin to skin contact and having that bonding moment. We wanted a wedding where both of our families could be together to celebrate, to be there for our first dance. We wanted to be married for time and eternity. But because of a man he called his best friend, who surely would have been one of his groomsmen, Aaron and I will never have these opportunities. It has been torture to live with this new reality. I met Aaron a little over two years ago now, and I am still as in love with him as I was the first time I told him I loved him. I don't know that I'll ever be able to move on, to live with the guilt being the only one living our shared dreams. Then Aaron's father, Randy Davis, spoke to the judge, recalling the nightmare his family has gone through since Aaron's death. On November 12, 2022, I received a call from the Rome Police Department that my car that my son Aaron had been using was found in a ravine here in Rome, Georgia. As far as we knew, um, Aaron should have been at his girlfriend's house in Alabama the day before, so this was certainly unexpected. Since Aaron was staying in Rome the night of November 10th at the home of uh, Brandon Reisner, I called Brandon immediately to let him know and ask him if he knew why the car would be there. Um, Brandon acted concerned and mentioned that Aaron had stayed an extra day in Rome, and then he noticed that he had left sometime during the night before. With a few additional phone calls, Brandon added speculation as to what might have happened or where he may have been going, such as going home to receive the Nintendo Switch game system that was mentioned previously. He also mentioned to me that Aaron may have been suicidal and tried to kill himself. Um, Brandon even came down to the site where the car was found and attempted to search for Aaron. Then Aaron's father spoke on the goals Aaron had for himself as a fresh graduate from college. He had just come home and was so excited. He had just out, felt like he had just kind of hit that check mark where he was ready to, to launch off into life. He decided that he wasn't convinced that, yet that law school was for him, and so that he, but he thought he would be a great teacher. So the morning before driving to Rome, he had aced the GACE exam required for applying for a teaching certificate program. He would have been an amazing teacher and could have impacted many lives that way. His long-range goal was to become a college professor if he ultimately de uh, decided that law school was not for him. It's such a tragedy to me that so much potential was wasted due to the, def to the defendant's actions. Aaron's father, Randy, also expressed to the judge his devastation of learning his son's murderer was someone once close to the entire family. The psychological scars from betrayal from one who we treated like a son or brother is irreparable. Every time I hear my son, Micah, refer to murdering an opponent in a video game, I feel pain. I work with elderly people at an assisted living center now um, who are naturally conversational when I discuss and always ask me, how many children do you have? Um, instead of answering five, which is correct, I usually have to answer four because I don't want to get into that with them. I don't need to burden them with, with what's going on in my life. But it's a challenge for me. I've been waiting for this day to try to begin healing from this as it's still hard to fathom whether this is a real event and that, is not just, that he's not just away at college still. I've done what I can to try to keep myself as busy as possible, um, working, working, having a, 
um, a secondary um, you know, job that I work on, um, trying to spend time with the family, being active at all times in order to not let my mind have to think about what happened. I do believe in both justice and mercy. I believe that justice can be best satisfy, satisfied as Aaron will not be coming back. Would be The best justice would be for the defendant never to be allowed out of custody again. I do hope that he can find mercy with God and seek help while in custody to be able to plead with God for his mercy at the appropriate time. Beyond the hideousness of the crime itself is the ability to hide those intentions, a total lack of remorse such that I would never be satisfied, no matter how cooperative he would be in prison, that he could ever be trusted again. I feel that it would be wrong to make any recommendation other than life in prison without the possibility of parole for someone capable of committing a crime like this. Um, tell his other friends that he's doing better than ever while simultaneously covering up this hideous act and lying to us about what happened, even to the point of trying to make us believe that our son had tried to take his own life. As a father and husband, I've tried to be the stoic and strong one, especially as this has caused so much distress for my wife, Sarah. I fear that I haven't done this as well as I have uh, done enough as I try to understand this myself. I hope that no one has to go through what, our, what um, Aaron and our entire family has endured at the hands of Brandon Reisner. Thank you. Aaron's mother, Sarah Davis, gave an emotional statement to the judge. She said Aaron was very close to his siblings and should have been with the entire family that day to celebrate his little brother's birthday. It's Micah's birthday today, and he would should be here celebrating with my son. He, he organized whenever Luke... Aaron, uh, Micah had friends over. He helped play with them. Micah just loved how Aaron would play with him. Shortly before Aaron was murdered, I overheard Aaron four different times saying to Micah, quote, Mr. Micah, I picked out a game for us to play together, unquote. Micah has autism and he doesn't have people. And Brandon took the person he had, the cooler older brother that would play with him. Brandon knew how much Aaron's siblings needed and loved him, but Brandon stabbed Aaron to death, made him suffer first with that knowledge that Aaron was so needed. Brandon stole Aaron's life by murdering him and broke our hearts and devastated our lives. I have cried every day for a year and a half. I've had a hard time sleeping since Aaron's murder, and when I do, I have nightmares of Aaron being stabbed to death. Some people in our household had a fear of Brandon coming to our house and stabbing them to get death. And when they hear noises at night, they think it's Brandon breaking in, coming to murder everybody. Brandon is the worst type of evil, where he chose to stab Aaron to death and cause such a tremendous loss and pain to those who treated him with love. Brandon deserves to serve life in prison without the possibility of parole. When it came time for the defense's side, Reisner's parents gave tearful statements to the judge. His father, Jeremy, who went first, said prior to the murder, he never showed a sign of violence, but admitted his son struggled with his mental health. I realized that most people in this room and on those TVs are seeing a murderer, and they're seeing, and they're seeing what they're going to see, what they don't see. What they'll never see is the joy that he brought into our lives the day he was born. He's a kind, gentle person who never, ever showed a sign of violence in his life. He showed nothing but kindness. He was a part of the Davis's family. There was an open door, a revolving door. I took that boy to scout camp every week, every year. They were family. He loved the smile on those kids' faces when he would go over there. So we let him go over as much as he wanted. When he went on his mission, you could tell he was feeling more and more like he's looking at his life from the outside like he's not there. But we tried, we tried to get him out, offer him love and encouragement. He's the reason I choose the right. He's the reason I would pray at night because he set an example for me. 
He was always strong for me. When he went on his mission, he ended up getting counseling for the same reason, suicidal tendency, feeling detached, feeling like he's outside looking in. We knew something was wrong. We got help for him. He was home for a while, went back on his mission out in Utah, and it was the same thing. The mission president got him the help he needed. We knew he had Tourette's. We knew he had OCD. We knew there was something different. But again, he was filled with so much kindness and love. Your Honor, we firmly believe that Brandon's actions were not the result of malice, but rather the culmination of his mental health conditions. We're committed to ensuring that he receives the ongoing treatment and support he needs to manage his illnesses. We ask for your compassion and understanding in recognizing the profound impact his mental health had on his behavior. We earnestly hope that with appropriate treatment and care, he can one day prove himself able to reintegrate into society and lead a productive life. We humbly request that you consider a sentence that would be conducive to mental health treatment and eventual redemption. Our family is dedicated to supporting Brandon during this time in custody, during his time in custody, and we're prepared to take all the necessary steps to ensure his continued rehabilitation while serving out his sentence. Thank you for taking this time to consider our request for leniency and the possibility of parole. Reisner's mother, Jenny Lee, began her statement with an emotional apology to Aaron's family before pleading to the judge to spare her son from spending the rest of his life in prison. How sorry I am for the Davis's loss. And I carry that grief with me every day. But I have to let you know about Brandon. I never imagined that I might one day have to stand here and ask for hope for the life of one of my children. I never thought that I would have to defend one of my children's characters because, I'm sorry. I never thought I would have to defend one of my children's characters because they have shown their character through the lives they live. But until these last couple of years, I always assumed that a person's character was defined by how they lived their life. However, I have come to believe that determining someone's character is much more complicated than taking a snapshot of their life. A simple gl glance at their life does not show you the trials that they have faced or the obstacles that they have overcome. <sighs> My youngest child, Brandon, has taught me this. As his mother, I cannot define him by his worst moment. So I ask you today to consider what defines our character. Does our one worst act, despite a good life, define all that we are? Can one horrific mistake erase a lifetime of love and kindness? I cannot believe it does. And I hope you can see that too. My child is kind and a loving human being who suffers from severe mental illness that were not recognized or dealt with in time to save two very good people's lives. Aaron Davis's and my son's. I ask that the time that he serves will be in a facility that can teach him 
treat him and help him overcome his mental issues. I ask that you consider granting him hope for a future outside of prison mall someday so that he may one day return to the family that loves him. Echoing what Reisner's parents expressed, Reisner's attorney argued he should eventually be granted parole. The tragedy that happened that night is, is, is not fixable. And I can't begin to feel the way the Davis family feels right now. But we are here, Your Honor, for a sort of business, and that is the sentencing. Every one of their victim impact statements <laughs> was very, very difficult to hear. <clears throat> but I'm advocating on, on behalf of Brandon. I'm not saying somehow that he get released early uh, outside of the 30 years. I'm not suggesting anything that's, that, that's not completely legal. I'm, I'm making an argument for mercy. I'm making an argument in equity. I'm making an argument for a kid that maybe if he had a little bit better therapy or a little bit better doctor once upon a time, this would have never have happened. But the defense's argument and emotional pleas from Brandon Reisner's parents weren't enough to sway the judge. Both of these young men have been loved throughout their lives. And I know all of you are experiencing tremendous pain, including the Reisner family. But the pain of Aaron's family far exceeds that. Uh, to have a young son brutally murdered is unfathomable. I hope that your fond and loving memories of Aaron and that your faith will provide you some comfort as your life continues. Having said that, I have considered all of the facts and circumstances of this case and counsel's arguments. And I have come to the conclusion that justice requires that Mr. Reisner be sentenced on count one to imprisonment for life without parole. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's based upon the premeditation, the manner of death, and the efforts to cover up all of the acts. On count two, felony murder that will be vacated by operation of law. Count three, to which Mr. Reisner also pled guilty, will be vacated by operation of law. Count four, the aggravated assault, will be merged into count one, as will count five, aggravated assault, and count six, aggravated battery. Count seven, concealing the death of another. The sentence will be 10 years. Count eight, abandonment of a dead body. There will be a sentence of three years. Count nine, theft by taking. Motor vehicle with a value more than $5,000. The sentence will be 10 years. Count 10, removal of body parts. Be a sentence of 12 months. Count 11, tampering with evidence. Be a sentence of 10 years. And count 12, obstruction. That's a misdemeanor. The sentence will be 12 months. So the total sentence is 
life imprisonment without parole. Did you want to add something, Ms. Mayo? Your Honor, count 11 is a misdemeanor. You had said 10 years. Count 11, yes, tampering sir. with evidence? Yes, sir. Well, I thought I looked that up. Okay, that will be a sentence of 12 months as opposed to 10 years. The Senate speaks for itself. God bless everybody in the courtroom. Brandon Reisner didn't speak during his sentencing hearing. Online records reveal he's still behind bars in the Floyd County Jail before he's transported to prison. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Elizabeth Milner.